This week on Sail Up, we're talking about chartering. We've basically compiled a whole list of cock-ups. Well, we haven't compiled a list of cock-ups. We've found a whole load of interesting things which you might find useful. So where do we start? We could talk about boats, the gear, the people you go with, the insurance, which is super important. But I'm going to leave that till the end because I know Chris wants to talk about boats. Yeah, let's talk about boats. That's okay. actually way more important than anything else. Let's start off with something simple, which is the size of the boat you choose. <laughs> Yeah, for the size, the basics of it is don't go too big. Go with what you're happy with and um, what you're used to. Yeah, it might be tempting to get that bigger boat, but you don't want to be the one in the marina who can't maneuver their boat. No, I think the thing is as well, we speak to so many people now who've done this, they've gone a bit too big, and the stress from the skipper and the crew transpires to a lot of shouting, and then they go off, and you just end up with this uneasy feeling for the rest of the week, and it's not a good way to start the week. And every time you come into it, an anchorage is not the way you want to be worrying about it. Big isn't that. always best, right? Maybe not. No. <laughs> but another thing to look at in the boats would be definitely the cockpit, do you reckon? Yeah, cockpit size, something quite often forgotten about. Yeah. You know, if you're in a hot country, you're probably going to spend a lot of time out. Yeah, that's out right. There. And it's worth thinking the likes of, say, a, I don't know, a Beneteau 40 two or something like that has got a much bigger cockpit than, let's say, an Oyster 55 even. And that's because they're designed for, say, Mediterranean, you know? And that big sort of area out the back is so sort of linked directly to swimming, having a barbecue on board, getting in the water nice and easily. Just think about the type of boat and the shape of it as well, not just... Yeah, because maybe planning to do some heavy weather sailing, you want a smaller, more secure centre cockpit. That's a fair point, yeah. And again, moving into that from there, I think that links us directly into mainsail choice, which I think is often yeah. overlooked, actually. Is it going to be, sorry, in-mass furling, or is it going to be traditional slab, slab reefing? reefing? So you've got performance issues and furling things to worry about if you're not used to that, which you shouldn't really have a problem with, but just putting that one out there, people have wished they'd gone the other way. Yeah. The other thing not to forget about is maybe making sure you've got bow thruster, because that is definitely going to help if you're not used to manoeuvring a boat yeah. Even around anchorages, never mind marinas, right? Another thing to quickly look at would be cost of certain things. You know, some boats obviously cost more than others, but it's the cost after the initial charter cost to think about <laughs> here. So we're talking about mooring costs. Now we have talked about cats versus monos, and we'll link that video up there, but that is directly attached to that. And then secondly to that, I would say motorboats, if you're chartering a motorboat, be aware of the engine because some of them things are pretty thirsty, hey? <laughs> it can add up. Yeah. yeah, people have been shocked. <laughs> okay, so, mm -hmm. moving on to people. So it's as basic as who you're going to pick to go on holiday with. Sometimes people, because they've known each other a long time, or sometimes not a long time, but they just don't feel comfortable asking certain questions. They don't get asked and then it all comes out later. Yeah, yeah, you've got to be really sure on capabilities, sailing capabilities, and I think a sound understanding of their expectations in terms of who's planning to sail, who's planning to eat ice cream and go to the tourist attraction. So asking those questions before you spend the time on the water is probably a good idea. Yeah, and another big one kept coming up was budget. So people have different perception on budget. So you kind of have to be in agreement as to what the budget is, how it's going to be spent, how things are going to be done on the trip. Yeah, everyone's got a budget, that's for sure. Uh, certainly me. <laughs> <laughs> and then when it comes to anchoring as well, that budget I think is transpired in that too. And, you know, sometimes obviously being in a marina can work out very expensive, but some people just don't like going into marinas, they like anchoring. So having the yeah. understanding of who wants to anchor and who wants to be in a marina and understanding the ratio that's going to be expected yeah. is, is worthwhile speaking about. I think land. approaching those things up front is going to make a big difference. So that leads on quite nicely to the next topic, which is to do with basically planning your trip. Itinerary. Itinerary. Yeah. So I think it's safe to say that planning your itinerary is going to be one of the most exciting things. We're not going to teach you how to suck eggs, anyone can plan their holiday, but I think what came out most was things people forgot when they were planning their itinerary. Yeah, I mean some of it's really simple and if you sail in areas with, you know, strong tides and wind over tide becomes a problem, things like that, then it's not going to be a surprise to you, but if you're not used to sailing in tides and you've not experienced strong wind over tide currents and stuff like that, <laughs> Be aware of them because there's nothing worse than saying, okay, we're going to be at that anchorage tonight. And you go out, I mean, we only saw it just the other day, a boat set off up into Scotland against eight knots of tide. And, well, they were trying their best to go forwards and we're going backwards. <laughs> Not to stop. 
<laughs> so yeah, be aware of uh, tidal streams, tides, currents. Yeah, currents. But then also trade winds as well as I'd say local anomalies. So we've got like wind acceleration areas and places like the Canary Islands and things like that, where the wind will just come from nowhere. Just be aware that those things might jump in and and time zones as well. Yeah, time zones. You don't want to land in somewhere tropical and. Plan to be out that day for a full day sailing, but realize you're... Uh, everyone's jet lagged. Everyone's jet lagged. <laughs> yeah. Which apparently it happens. Um, and next we're gonna talk about location, where you choose to go. So what actually came up quite often was that people felt that they'd actually picked the wrong location, which is really surprising because you think it's like the one thing that you could get right. I wanna go there. <laughs> I know you think that would be easy, right? But it happens. It does happen and I think Bizarre as it might sound, weather seems to be one of the big things that people make a cock up on here. And of course, there's all sorts of weather to look at, so let's just make that a, a basic point. But in general, let's just talk about wind now. If you're one who is sailing every day, then somewhere like the BVIs might be brilliant, they say. But, it, you know, because it's generally windy every day. But it might be too much wind for certain people, so that's not good. And on the other side of things, if you went to the Mediterranean, you might be thinking, oh, I'm going to sail every day, this wonderful sailing trip. But the winds are generally quite fickle there, so you might find you're actually going to end up motoring a lot more. So that, surprisingly, seems to affect a lot of people. And it actually ties in well to the next point, which is to do with sort of proximity of marinas or anchorages. Yeah, you need to think about how long everybody's happy sailing on the boat every day. If you're going to want an anchorage every, you know, every couple of nautical miles or if you're happy to do a big sail in between them. Yeah, and I guess from that point as well, when we're thinking about anchorages and moorings, it's also understanding the anchorages and moorings, if it's mooring boys, med moorings, or what type of situation you've got at that place. <laughs> so yeah, understanding what's what in, in each location will, will go a long way. And lastly for a location is sort of seasons. Yeah. Basically, you don't want to be the guy who picks a cheap charger holiday, which is in hurricane season. <laughs> That's true, but you also, another one with place actually, you also don't want to be that person who books this beautiful idyllic spot because I've seen this nice photograph on Instagram or something and then it turns out to be like party central. Yeah. And <laughs> check it out first, definitely. That's a really good point. <laughs> party central or <Yeah>. not. <laughs> I always find that one so funny. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to what gear to take. So you've picked your location, so then you, you want to know what gear to take. Okay, so gear. Now, not surprisingly, the most commonly found problem was that people overpack. Yeah, overpacking was a problem, uh, but we're not going to tell you what to pack and what not to pack, but I think the most important thing is what to pack in. <laughs> yeah, so you want to find a bag which is not rigid, not, you know, they're nice, these nice rigid sort of flight Trolley, bags and all yeah. that, but they generally don't fit easily in the bilge of a boat. You want something which is soft, like a duffel bag or something like that. Yeah. But what do you actually put in the bag? <laughs> well, definitely don't forget your sunglasses. <laughs> Yeah, well, sunglasses, definitely, if it's hot. I mean, it does turn out that people forget those. But even if you go in somewhere which is not that sunny, I think sunglasses are a really important thing, even for spray or just glare on days where you wouldn't expect it, especially if you happen to have been on a bit of a night out and you've got a bit of a sore hair. <laughs> Maybe a good idea. The other important thing is deck shoes. Now, they don't have to be fancy-pancy deck shoes. These just have to be non-marking shoes. Yeah, and I think even for really hot places, you know, you're off to the med or somewhere like that, it's going to be scorching hot. It, you know, think about the boat you've chartered as well. Does it have a teak deck? Because you've got to be pretty hardy to walk around a teak deck in bare feet. Yeah, so you <laughs> might think, I don't need shoes, I'm going to be in bare feet or flip-flops or whatever all week. Wishful thinking, you're not going to be able to walk on the decks in bare feet, so make sure you have protection there. And the other surprising thing is a wind jacket people wish they had, because yeah. when you're out there, um, even in hot conditions, with a bit of a breeze, with a bit of sunstroke or whatever, you get a bit of a chill out there on the water, so wind jacket's good. Yeah, definitely. So I think that pretty much covers the gear side of things, and we're just going to move on to something a little bit more formal. We're going to talk about qualifications and then straight on to insurance as well. And that'll be a wrap. Yeah. So we touched on competence a little bit earlier on. We're now going to talk about the actual qualification that you're going to need on board. But don't fret, not everybody on board needs a qualification. No, not everyone needs a qualification, but if you are sort of wanting to learn a little bit more, there's a few knots and tricks and things like that. It's all quite simple stuff, terminology. 
If you do want to learn a bit more, we'll link a little video up there which might help you learn that. But moving back into the, the whole qualifications thing, the basic minimum requirement is the ICC, which is the International Certificate of Competence. Which is a mouthful. <laughs> it is a mouthful. <laughs> it's effectively in the UK that is, it's, kind of, it's the day skippers in the UK. So that's your minimum thing. And you, you might also find that in other parts of the world, you need to just be aware of what their rules regulations are. For example, Greece, you need to have two skippers as a minimum. So that's two qualified skippers. Yeah, but don't forget that most chartering companies will basically hire out a skipper for you if need be, yeah. whether that's your second skipper or your main skipper. And they can also offer a skipper for the first couple of days if you just want that sort of handover period. Yeah, so there's usually a way around it, which is quite nice. Um, I think that pretty much covers qualifications and I guess we've just got to run straight on into that good old topic of insurance. Yeah. <laughs> so there's two kind of insurances, you've got your normal sort of holiday and travel insurance and then you've got the actual yacht sort of sailing insurance which is provided by the chartering company. Yeah, so basically if we started off with the travel insurance, of course, I think one of the things that most people have been telling us is we've got to be very careful with cancellations because if the skipper was to, I don't know, fall over, something like that, you've just fallen over recently, Jenny's bust her feet, she's actually <laughs> on crutches at the moment, and it happens that easy. But if you were the skipper, that's kind of the end of the story. Really. Yeah, if the skipper's down, the whole crew's down, because you can't go without your skipper. So yeah. cancellation policy came up a couple of times. Yeah. And then, as Chris said, medical insurance, covering yourself there. Yeah. So the next thing we've got is uh, moving into the sailing boat side of stuff. And I guess the first one is the um, the deposit insurance. So, of course, you've always got your your general insurance that the, the, the charter company will make you take. But do you want to take out that deposit insurance? Yeah, because basically, if you're going to make a claim, they're going to take the excess out of your deposit. So people have said that typically they wished or they did the second time whatever take out the deposit insurance yeah which covers you for that because i think the thing with insuring a boat is you've always got to remember that you might be the best skipper in the world but there's a lot of things can go wrong such as you know it's a boat you don't know if you're going to moor and all of a sudden you've got no engine then it's out of your control what happens we've seen that happen before We've seen people go in and move beautifully and then someone collides into them. That's what I was going to say. Insurance. Like with chartering, particularly areas where there's lots of chartering, it's probably not going to be you causing the damage. It's going to be someone else. It seems to be in. that way. I mean, we've repaired a lot of boats <laughs> and it always seems to be someone else. Yeah, you're going to cover yourself for that. And yeah. on that note, there is such a thing as skipper's liability insurance again, which yeah. people have recommended that you do just to cover your ass. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just legal fees as well and all that kind of thing are often covered in the skipper's liability insurance, which is good. Um, upon actually taking the boat into your own possession when you get there as well, this is really important. And again, regarding claims that might be made against you, check the boat over really, really well. Look out for simple things. Yeah, and try and have the operator or the owner there as well when you're doing that so it's not your word against theirs. Yeah, sure. And just simple things. Make sure the bow, the bow thruster works. Make sure that the winches work or the electric Windless. winches if you've got them. Windless is really important. Check over the rig quickly would be my Yeah, furling well. systems. Furling systems, they often seize, don't work. One thing like and another other thing I think which is really important for charter boats Check all the cleats to make sure the cleats are solid and there's not lots of little cracks around them because <laughs> it happens and people get pulled up on it. Yeah, I guess these boats get hammered, don't they? Well, the thing is, as a boat builder, I, I see the other end of the stick. I just get the repairs to do, didn't I? That's what used to happen. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Such is life. <laughs> so I hope this video has given you guys a little bit of an insight into how to make sure you get the most out of your charging. Yeah, <laughs> so do stick around. Throw us a subscribe if you would, that would be absolutely awesome for the channel. But I think what's more important is a thumbs up. Hit that thumbs up button, Smile please, because I'm pretty sure that is what Google is after just now. So hit you the thumbs that. up. I want to like. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we love it as well. We love it as well. We'll see you next time, guys. See you next week. <laughs>